good to be here today. When Pastor Dave talked about reality of knowing Jesus and he talked to him this morning, I thought, yes, and he talked to me. Amen. It's great to, when he talks to us. Amen. So, as we come to the word of the Lord today, I'm trying to fix my little, my Bible here. It's acting up on me. <laughs> That's the problem of some of these technology things. Oh, and I got to be able to use my fingers here. Ah. Well, I don't know what to do. We'll just, we'll just do it. Does, does somebody have a Bible I can use? Because there's a couple of scriptures I want to read, and my computer's all froze up. Yeah. It, it's all frozen. I got a frozen word. <laughs> but I got a hot spirit. Come on. Brother Frank, I need them glasses back there. <laughs> I didn't need the glasses for my computer, but I need them for this. Help me, Lord. Help me. <laughs> uh, thank, thank you. They're women's glasses, so if I can't read right, it's because of that. <laughs> Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord, and my just claim is passed over by my God. Have you not known, have you not heard, that the everlasting Father The creator of the ends of the earth neither faints nor is weary. I like that. When we're weary, he's never weary. His understanding is as unsearchable. He gives power to the weak. And to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary. And the young men shall utterly fail. But those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up his wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. I'm going to speak to you this morning on He calms the seas. It's a very familiar passage in Scripture found in. Mark chapter 4, and it's in some of the other Gospels. But the one I'm going to be reading from this morning is going to be in Mark chapter 4, verse 35. Sister Hannah's got them on the screen. Then 
That day, when the evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. Continue down. <laughs> and a furious squall came up. That's a storm. And the waves broke over, over the boat so that it was ready or nearly to swamp or nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern of the ship, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drowned? He got up, he rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. And he said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still, boy, that's a powerful voice. Do you still have no faith. In other words, as as much time as I've had with you, you still have no faith. He said it in another passage like this. Ever learning and never coming to the knowledge. How long do you learn before you come to the knowledge? How much do I have to be with you in order for your faith to be strong? That's what Jesus is basically saying to these here. Father, let the word of the Lord, which is open before us, we humbly pray that you would turn. And as we turn to this passage, that we may be encountered by you, who is the one in whom we have sung about today. He is the Lord of the nature and the ruler of this world. Help us to this end, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus did not come to make you a better self. He did not come for you to turn over a new leaf. He did not come that you could come to a higher enlightenment. He didn't come to make you good. He came to make you alive. For we were dead in our trespasses and sin but he came to bring us life. If you don't know Jesus, then you're truly a walking zombie, existing, but not living. Well, clearly, this is a familiar story. Any of us who have been around church at any length of time have heard about this story, preached on it many times, from Sunday school, the artwork in our homes, in some of our homes, has that picture of Jesus standing in the midst of that storm. So this is a very common verse. We also have come to the conclusion that the message of this particular little section of Mark that's also in other areas of the Gospels there 
is simply this, that Jesus calms the storm in the sea, and he can calm the storms in your life. Now, I want to let you know something. If that was all that this story is, is and that it, all that it is teaching, then maybe we ought to just say this a couple times to ourselves and we can go home. You can have the benediction, prayer, and gone. So, he can calm the storms of the sea, and he can calm your storms. He can calm the storms of the sea, and he can calm your storms. Amen? Let's go home. <laughs> maybe by now you might think that maybe I have a little more to say about this story. How many know that you can have two truths both of them can be right. I think Jesus has a little more to say about this. I'm not sure that that is really the actual point that Jesus was trying to drive home to these disciples on this boat. Even though it's true for what I said. I think we need to look at some details here. There's a common phrase I've heard most of my life, but as I ask other people, they haven't heard, heard it so much. Maybe you've heard the, the, the phrase that the devil is in the details. How many ever heard that phrase, the devil's in the details? In other words... That if you don't pay close enough attention to the details of something, you could wind up with some problems at the end. How many of you would like to go to the operating room and the doctor not take care of all the details? leaving a sponge in you or, or leaving some clip inside of you or, or some kind of, whoops, we missed that one. How many know that there's some things that you don't want to hear, oops, in? Contractors have drawings, and they're very detailed of everything that is in the building. The smallest of detail, because if you leave a detail out, you could have a problem, and the devil is in the details. Actually, that statement came about in the late 1800s. According to dictionary.com, it came about when it was translated by a German philosopher and poet, Friedrich Nietzsche. He quoted it and it was translated The devil is in the details. But actually, that phrase was mistranslated. The real phrase was earlier it said that God is in the details. See, from our perspective, God better be in the details. And as you look at his word, and as you look through the Old Testament, and the tabernacle, and the priest, and all the pictures, and we're studying about the prophetic Christ, there's a lot of detail out there, and you better pay attention to it. How many know that God is concerned about every detail in our life, to the very finest point? 
When they send a rocket ship out of Fort Lauderdale and it heads for the moon, they can't be off at all. Because a hundredth of an inch on Earth, they can miss the moon by a million miles. They better take care of the details. See, our mother, when problems hit our home, when sickness came, she always said, let's pray about it. It was our first place to go, not our last resort. See, I think sometimes that we be depend upon all of these other trappings and we lose the relationship with Christ because we don't go to him first and get God in the details. A lot of misunderstandings go on when we don't get the details. How many, how many, are we back on now? I can't even put my hand in my pocket. I'm trying not to fray. Hello? Hello? Don't mess it up. <laughs> yeah, you can have it. Thank you. I told Brother David when he asked me if I wanted the mic or that, I said, well, I get to use my hands so much, and I got to also pay attention to using my hands here on my computer that I don't know where I may start and be at the end very quickly. Or I may get stuck somewhere and go back and repeat it. <laughs> but how many have had misunderstandings because you thought you explained something very clearly and the person that you explained it to, it got totally wrong. Yeah. When, I, when I speak about understanding and misunderstanding, Actually, we know more about misunderstanding than we do about understanding. Do you understand that? Yeah. <laughs> Anytime you have humans relating to other humans, you've got the potential of misunderstanding. Because somehow your minds are all weird to mine. And somehow... My mind is all weird to yours. Sometimes the details that I think is important, you don't think they're that important. And some of them that you think are important, I don't think is important. We give ourselves to a lot of misunderstanding because we don't pay attention to the details. Heard the story of a man who walked into his home and he announced to his wife that Bill and Peggy had a little baby boy. Well, Peggy, desiring to know more detail, asked her husband, well, when was the baby born? He said, I don't know. All I know is that Bill and Peggy had a baby boy. She said, well, was the baby healthy? He said, I don't know. All I know 
is that Bill and Peggy had a little baby boy. Well, did the baby have hair or did it was it bald? She, he said, I don't know. By this time, you could probably say the rest of it, right? All I know is that Bill and Peggy had a little baby boy. The wife became frustrated. And she said, you don't know very much. I think I'll call Peggy and find out. He said, I think that's a good idea because all I know <laughs> is that Bill and Peggy had a little baby boy. Details. Oh, how they can mess us up. As we look at this story, there were some details. When we, those of us that have had any kind of schooling at all, there was tests that were given, right? God tests us too. His tests are generally pop quizzes, unannounced. But the one thing I really like about God's pop quizzes, if he's going to give them, is he always gives us an open book. <laughs> and he gives us plenty of time to learn it. And he said, actually, that if you lack wisdom about something, you can just continue to ask him. And he's not going to scold you and tell you, I've told you a thousand times. My granddaughter was really frustrating herself over a test that she was going to have. And I told her, I said, baby, you never have to worry about a test. She looked at me like I'd shot him from a rocket out of Mars. John Gray tells me that I'm from Mars and that she's from Venus anyway. So I, I did, But she looked at me like, what are you talking about? I said, you never have to worry about the material and the test. Because if you know the material, you'll always pass the test. See, the problem that we have is when things come about us, around us, and the storms happen in our life, it seems like some of us, as we take tests, it, Papa, it just seems like that everything just vanishes from my head when I get to that test. It seemed like I knew all the material, but it, it just vanished. It just left. First, part of this detail is we see the bolt again. In chapter 3, Jesus was going to preach and teach, and he said, hey, guys, I think it'd be a good idea if you get a boat. Because if the crowd gets too big, I may have to get me a floating pulpit. Well, sure enough, in chapter 4, the crowd got so large that Jesus went into the boat and taught, his, taught the crowd. Oh, they had such a wonderful meeting. They had such a good time. But then we find this scripture, the boat again. Other boats in there, details. See, this story just is not about Jesus calming the sea. He's wanting to give details for us to get a bigger picture here. Oh, 
The disciples were all happy about, you know, I mean, hey, we got a big crowd here, Jesus. Well, hey, we're doing a good job. These people are really plugged in. And Jesus said, I think I'm going to go somewhere else. Let's go. So he says to his disciples toward the evening time, let us go over to the other side. Okay. Now Mark writing this had to be told the story. And the person who's told him the story, which we don't really know who it was, it was probably Peter, because he was a big mouth. I think he was from the trumpeter class. But anyway, be, be that as it may. See, if you're writing a story for the newspaper, one of the things that you want to do is give details to those that are reading it so that they got a good idea about what's going on. So these details Peter was giving or, the, or whoever was giving Mark the information was important to them so that the people that are reading it can understand that there's some significance to it all. Don't just write the big thing that they got in a storm and Jesus calmed it. That's the big thing. That's, oh, that's the punchline. Give them some details so they can appreciate the headline. There was also a furious storm. It even gives details that the waves were coming over inside the boat. I've been on that sea. I remember the second time I was on it, clouds came up and we had a little storm and I thought I'd get to the front of that boat and I'd command that storm to stop. And 18 people that I took to Israel, they all laughed at me. The storm didn't stop. I was hoping for a reenactment, but it didn't happen. They were in danger. What's Jesus doing? He said, guys, I'm tired. I've been, I've been talking all day to this crowd. I've been working all here. I think I'll go to the back of the ship. He found him a little pillow, and he said, I think I'll lay down on it, and I'll go to sleep. Well, that's, that's detail. It's quite remarkable that this storm could be so violent and Jesus could sleep right through it. See, I don't think when that storm got to the point that these disciples feared for their own life, I don't think they were talking to each other and saying, I wonder which one ought to go try to wake Jesus up. Maybe we could draw some straws. And maybe we could find somebody to go kind of shake him a little bit. No, sir. They ran to him. Wake up, wake up, wake up. Then they asked this question. Should have not been the question they asked. Isn't it something that when we get in distress, the things that can come out of our mouth? See, it actually revealed their hearts. Do you not care if we drowned? Well, you talk about a bunch of narcissistic characters. They weren't concerned about Jesus drowning. They were concerned about themselves drowning. Don't you care if we drown? They were completely off the end and off the chart with hysteria. When 
Jesus finally got his eyes open and he sorted things out, the Bible said, that he, that he said, why are you so afraid? What's going on with you? What's, what's happening with you? Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? Then he really freaked them out. Because he just said, quiet, be still. Now, that didn't take 25 minutes to happen. And then they could have said, well, you know, it just died down on its own. No, sir. As soon as he said that, calm. That same Lord that has a voice that can speak to nature, create the worlds, hang them in space and tell them to rotate a certain way, and speak to the wind and speak to the waves and speak to the sea and speak to the calamities of our life and immediately peace on that sea. So there's the details. That's important for us to know these details because when we face the world, people will tell you that the Bible is just a bunch of concocted writing by a bunch of guys. When you try to tell them it's the word of God, uh, well, it's just men that wrote it. Just a big invention. You don't really have to pay much attention to it at all. Most of the time, they haven't read it at all. They just, looked, they just heard somebody say, say something. Let me ask you a question. Why were the disciples in that boat on the sea? Because we're going to get into why this story, this story is so significant. Why were they out there? It's a, this is not a pop quiz. It's easy. Because Jesus said... Let us get into the boat and go to the other side. They were not out in the sea because they were bad people. And they were disobedient to God. And now they're in trouble. No. They were in the absolute will of God. They had the creator of the universe with them. They gave them the command, let us go over to the other side. No wonder he answered, don't you have any faith? They were not being disobedient. They were doing what Jesus said. See, that's what throws us off sometimes. Here we are doing what God wants us to do. Here we are trying to, trying to live the way he wants us to live. And things go haywire. And wait, you know what the first thing we do? We start binding the devil. Uh-oh. Maybe not all of the circumstances of your life is brought on by the devil. Now, he can get in the middle of them and get into your mind and play tricks on your mind. And we can get so busy rebuking the devil that we don't come to the learning of what Jesus wanted to teach them.
is so sweet to trust in Jesus. Just to take him at his word. It was out of their obedience to him that this storm arose. They were right in the middle of the will of God. God leads us through difficulties. He's trying to teach us that when we do walk through difficulties that we can't see and we can't be in control of, that he is in control and that he sees. We don't have to get all freaked out about it. You know what you ought to get freaked out about? It is how God resolves it. That's when you get freaked out. Whoo! We've seen people get up from wheelchairs. We've seen cancer removed. We've seen people that have been healed by the dynamic power of God. We've seen people whose lives have been transformed by them coming to Jesus and saying, come into my life. And the greatest miracle of all just took place in your life. You were dead, and now you live. As you read the Bible, you're confronted with the circumstances that get out of control. In Daniel, we see the three Hebrew children. They would not bow under the pressure of the crowd or the orders of the king to an idol and he said, I'm going to throw you in that furnace over there if you don't bow. They didn't bow. They maintained a calmness in heart. Nebuchadnezzar said, turn that fire up seven times hotter. He threw those boys into that furnace, had them thrown in, and the, these were mighty soldiers that threw them in and they were killed because of the heat of that furnace. Nebuchadnezzar and his princes looked into that furnace and there was three and Nebuchadnezzar said, I thought we threw three in there and I see four. Nebuchadnezzar, he started shaking a little bit. Went to the side and he called them out. He said, come on out of here, boys. There's some details here that's real important. When we go through the fire and we go through the flame, they walked out of that furnace. The cords that had bound them were burned off. They, had, they didn't get a hair singed on their bodies. Their clothes was still intact. And the Bible says there wasn't even a smell of smoke on them. My goodness. A lot of my life is counseling people. And boy, they got burns all over their bodies and they smell like smoke. They're singing gloom, despair, or agony on the end. Deep, dark, depression, excessive misery. If it weren't for bad luck, I'd have no luck at all. Oh, they're just burning to death. I mean, they got, they, I, they don't have to tell me they've been in the fire. I can see it. Daniel was told later on in chapter 6, by Darius, he said, you can't pray. And Daniel said, I'm going to pray. As his custom was, he went up into his room turned his face toward Jerusalem and, let, and, and prayed. Do you realize that on both of these occasions in Daniel, that he, they were squealed on? There was, they were squealed on. How many know that people are looking at your life to see whether or not you're going to bend and bow or whether or not you're going to continue your relationship with God? And as soon as you don't, they're going to, they, as soon as you do continue or you don't, they're going to squeal on you. 
Now, Ballast, you told us that we couldn't bring our Bible to work and read it, but that guy's still bringing his Bible there. Oh, okay. So the king made an order that if Daniel prayed again, that they'd throw him in a den of lions. I think Pastor David preached, I, I think, probably oh, 50, 60 years ago. And <laughs> He was always preaching. He's the oldest, as y'all know. He's the ugliest, as y'all know. And he's the shortest, as y'all know. But he got a big mouth. <laughs> I don't know where I was going to go with that, but I, I'm, I'm going somewhere. <laughs> He made the statement that Daniel was not thrown into a den of lions. He was thrown into a lion, or not a lion's den, but in a den of lions, which makes all the difference in the world. Because you could be thrown into a den and no lions be there. But if they're thrown into a den of lions, you know there are going to be some lions in there. Darius the king was so upset through the night that he could not sleep. So early in the morning, he comes down there and he starts, Daniel! And, and he, he woke Daniel up because Daniel had made his bed on the body of a lion. I love... I love that the scripture there when he was facing that death and that in that whole thing and, and Darius let me show you let me read that little passage there in, in chapter 6 the king lamented and cried Daniel and Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God has sent an angel, and he has shut the mouths of the lion. And they didn't hurt me. I always wondered what the last word said, O king, have I done no hurt? I haven't hurt them either. <laughs> That's kind of like the way I see it. They didn't hurt me, and I didn't hurt them back. No harm. Playing basketball, he was like, no blood, no foul. <laughs> Let the games continue. It is my understanding as you read about the Sea of Galilee, because of the, where it was, the location of it, where it was in sea level, the mountains around it, that there was what would, what would be considered, as we know today, what would be called clear air disturbance. If you've ever been on an airplane, sometimes a pilot may come on and say, folks, you need to buckle up your seatbelt, just kind of keep it on because we could encounter some turbulence. Now, when there's storm clouds out there and all of this kind of stuff going on, they can see the turbulence. But there's sometimes they can't see the turbulence. So they say, kind of keep your belt kind of tight. They say that that's some things that happen on the Sea of Galilee that causes these storms to become so great. But, but think with me. These are men. Some of them have been on the boat. They've been on that sea. They've fished in that sea. They've crossed that sea many times. But they were scared to death.
So this routine journey, we just got up this morning. We were just headed to work. Just another day. Just another passing over the sea. Fortunately, I prayed this morning that the Lord would be with me. <laughs> and he didn't tell me to stay home from work, so I continued to go. It was just a routine trip across this ocean or the sea. Just another day in your life when the storm could come, a fiery experience could come. A lot of news today and over the past week about this little gal in Georgia who went out for a little run, never came home. Just another day of, of getting ready to exercise and lives were changed immediately. I have preached funerals of people's lives that was taken instantly. Lives shattered. Homes wrecked. Things can happen just in an ordinary trip to the store. Just a little trip down the lane of life, living and doing the will of God, and calamity happens. What, is, what do we do about that? Wrap this up. Don't you care if we drown? See, sadly, many people run from the cross instead of to the cross. They run away from God instead of to him. Whether a circumstance of great sickness doesn't work out the way we have it figured, and we want that person to live, but their life was taken, <coughs> can we trust him? Can we trust him when the fire is hot? When all of a sudden the family gets turned upside down. And many of us have been there. See, all of a sudden our family didn't work out the way we thought that it should work out. The kids didn't serve the Lord like we thought they should have. And our hearts are terrified what to do. So an application, every storm and every trial of our lives, there is another opportunity for us to wonder again of the identity and the majesty and the authority in Jesus. As we wrap this up this morning, you're sitting here in circumstances overwhelmed, don't know what to do. 
maybe there's some that would say, Lord, don't you care about me? Don't you care if I sink or swim in this? I'm so overwhelmed that I don't know what to do. Listen, folks, I'm trying to give you some honey from lions that have tried to destroy my life. And the lions that God has helped me to help others find honey in. I know the calamity of life. I know the little gal that has all of her stuff in her car. And that's where she's going to sleep. Because of major abuse in her home. Crying and saying, Pastor, I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. We can all come to those places of extremity. And it can come very quickly. And Jesus would say, could you trust me? Can you trust me? Or is everybody going to know by the blood marks on the road that you're having some problems? Is everybody going to know because of the countenance on your face and the spirit that you have? Oh, man, that guy, stay away from him. Stay away from her. Or can you trust him? There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. So when you're tempted to say, I'm going to drown, don't you care? There's a friend. Let's pray. If you're facing and the Spirit of the Lord is speaking to your heart today to help you to, in this pop quiz that you're taking this morning, can you take a step of faith? Can you rise up in faith and say, Lord, I'm going to trust you. Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for this record of an amazing power that's revealed before his disciples. We thank you for the encouragement that we get from realizing that these were just feeble folks like us. That in the midst of trauma and in the midst of the inescapable nature of their circumstances, at least from their perspective, they realized that their faith didn't much, amount to much at all. And they needed to see again your majesty and your power. And so do we. And as we look out on the days that lie ahead, in this vessel we call the church, buffeted on every side, seems like it's being swamped. In the church of God, there's water that's coming over the top by all kinds of horses. Lord, we need you. Lord, we pray that these events does not obscure us from the reality of your redeeming love and the reli reali reliability of your unerring word. So we pray this in Jesus' name. Come to our side, Jehovah Esau. We need your help. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Pastor David.